Welcome to On the Record, Election 2016, presented by WENY News. Here's your host, Ross DiMatte. Hello. Today I'll be sitting down with the candidates running to represent the 58th district in the New York State Senate. Geographically, it's one of New York's largest legislative districts, covering all of Chemung, Steuben, Schuyler, and Yates counties, and part of Tompkins County. Republican incumbent Tom O'Mara is being opposed by Democratic challenger Leslie Danks Burke. It's time now to put these candidates on the record. And I'm joined right now by Leslie Danks Burke. She is the Democratic challenger for the Senate seat here in our district. Leslie, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. Uh, let's get started with a little bit about yourself. You know, people might not know you. You're obviously the challenger for the seat. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. So I'm a taxpayer and a mother and an attorney in this district, and I am deeply concerned about the fair share that I don't see us getting from Albany. I am raising two young children here along with my husband, Cody. We live in Ithaca, New York, and the district is five counties. It includes most of Tompkins County and then all of Chemung, Schuyler, Steuben, and Yates counties. And unfortunately, this region has been left behind. I see that my children's schools don't get the same funding that other schools in the state of New York get. I see that jobs are leaving this region, our young people are leaving uh, to find employment, and I wanna see someone get into Albany and fight hard for our fair share. Awesome. You mentioned a, a lot of issues, and we're going to get to all of those uh, hopefully in the next uh, half hour or so. But I do want to start with, um, you know, you mentioned that you are a Democrat from Ithaca. And uh, I, I think that that brings up some concerns because, you know, in terms of voting, Ithaca tends to vote differently from a lot of the other counties in this area. So I guess why should voters be confident um, that you will listen to, you know, all of your constituents in all of the different counties in this area and represent uh, all of them in Albany? Well, I will continue once I'm elected exactly as I've been doing throughout this campaign. I put my campaign headquarters in downtown Elmira back at the beginning of our campaign in order to call attention to the real challenges that Elmira is facing. And Elmira's been left behind for decades. Uh, we've been struggling with uh, uh, high unemployment and very high taxes in this region. And that's something that hits folks across this district, regardless of which county you're talking about. I have been traveling across the five counties of this district. I, I certainly uh, live in Ithaca, but I get up every morning and travel to other parts of this district and what I find is that we have so much more in common than divides us and that's really exciting for me when I get to visit with folks in far-flung areas in Bath, in Dundee, in Penyan, in Horseheads and find that actually we're in this together we're facing the same challenges. We all see together that we aren't getting the funding we deserve. Our potholes are ridiculous across this district. Our yeah. taxes are high across this district. Our schools aren't getting the funding we deserve. And I think we can band together and do better. Now, one of the things you mentioned when you were kind of introducing uh, the backbone of your campaign is that you feel our area is not getting their just due compared to say downstate, the New York City area in terms of tax spending. Um, I found a 2011 study, and bear with me for a second because sure. I know it's five years ago, but it actually kind of showed the opposite in that um, New York City and downstate, they actually receive a smaller percentage of the tax money that they pay coming back in expenditures compared to uh, upstate, the rest of the state, our area too, um, saying that we actually get back uh, more money than we're paying in taxes. Um, so what has changed, do you think, in the past five years that uh, would, you know, support what you're saying that we're not getting what we deserve here in the southern tier well so sure it makes sense that the billionaires in new york city on a dollar for dollar basis would end up putting more dollars into the system than regular folks here in the southern tier in the finger lakes you can't compare it on a dollar for dollar basis you have to look at questions like the unemployment index uh, just last year for example Every area of New York State started gaining jobs in the wake of the 2008 recession, mm -hmm. except the Southern Tier. We're still losing jobs. And that's a real challenge. And we've got to face up to the fact that even if the billionaires are putting a few more dollars into the system, 
those of us here in the southern tier in the Finger Lakes uh, need to have our taxes reduced so that we can support our families, so that we can make sure that our young people have jobs when they, when they grow up, so that they don't leave, so that we're investing in our own. And when I see uh, the actual effective tax rate, so when you're looking at percentages, the folks in New York City, the, uh, the very wealthy people in New York City, and I'm not talking about the low income people, but I'm talking about the wealthy people in New York City, right. are paying substantially less less on the dollar than we are. And so if you make $100 and you're paying in 20 bucks into taxes and a billionaire in New York City makes $1,000 and he's only paying $10 in taxes, that's a real challenge. Even if he's paying $100 into taxes, that is more dollars than your 20 bucks. Right. But it is only 10% of his income and that's a real problem. So now you're getting into kind of the state tax code and, and uh, reforming that, if you will. What are some of the changes um, um, do you think about how taxes are divided? How can we fix that to, to tax the wealthier more in New York City so that uh, we do get more of the benefits that you're talking about? You're really hitting on something that I think about quite a bit. I've put out a fair share pledge for the Southern Tier and the Finger Lakes. This is five points that I intend to take action on within 100 days of getting elected to office. And this is actually a fairly unusual thing for a candidate who is not an incumbent to do, to come out and say this boldly, that I will take action on these five things. But I believe that our folks deserve to hear that from our elected officials, what exactly we plan to work on. And the those issues are first, I will take action to eliminate the Medicaid mandate. Look, if we paid for Medicaid in New York State the same way every other state in the country pays for Medicaid, it would cut taxes in Chemung County by 89% overnight. My opponent votes every year to keep that unfunded mandate. And I disagree with that vote. I would vote to make sure that that Medicaid mandate is eliminated from our Southern tier citizens. We also need to get our infrastructure dollars back. We pay a few cents every single time you fill up your gas tank at the pump, you pay a few cents and it goes into a fund called the Bridge and Highway Trust Fund. Mm. And that fund was designed to help upstate bridges and roads. It was put into place because we recognized that our upstate infrastructure was crumbling. But every single year, the legislature votes to take that money and not invest it in our upstate roads after all, but instead send it to New York City for capital improvement projects instead. Now, I'm sure that there's a reason to invest in New York City capital improvement projects. I'm, I'm sure that's uh, an expenditure that we should be considering, but why does that expenditure have to come out of money that was already earmarked for us? Right. I mean, it makes sense, and, and we have seen some of the struggling roads around here, but uh, that also you know, contributes to your idea of, of bringing more jobs to this area. We've obviously seen, you mentioned it, the struggles in jobs, both Elmira, Binghamton, the Southern Tier as a whole, uh, whereas many areas of the state, almost all of them, are gaining jobs every month. We're losing jobs here. So um, I guess what other ways or strategies do you have to bring more jobs here back into the Southern Tier? You're absolutely right, that if we had those infrastructure dollars here, then we would have the job investment that those dollars bring as well. And I say over and over that government is not in the business of creating jobs. And mm. frankly, any politician who tells you that he's created such and so number of jobs, I think is taking himself way too seriously. Yeah. But government is in the business of creating an environment in which people can create jobs. And then government needs to get out of the way. And right now what government is doing is burdening our local businesses with very high taxes, taxes that are higher than hedge funders in New York City have to pay because our local businesses very often pay their taxes uh, you know, as, as part of their earned income. And hedge funders get the carried interest loophole, which I believe should be eliminated. So our local people are struggling to even build one more job, two more jobs each year in their shops on Main Street, in their local businesses, in their local farms. We need to strip out the red tape. We need to strip out these very high taxes that are burdening our local businesses. And we need to make sure that we're investing in our own for generations to come. Sure. Now, you talked about politicians' job being to create an environment that is friendly to creating businesses. Um, I have to ask you about uh, the, the shale that we're sitting on and the idea of fracking because I think some people would argue that fracking would bring a lot of jobs to this area and could be a potential economic boon, but I know you're against fracking. Um, so do you believe that the, how does the 
risk, the potential risk of fracking to the environment outweigh the possibility of bringing jobs here to our area? Fracking is problematic to the environment, as you point out, but it's also a real problem for our economy. And any jobs that are created through fracking are not investments in our long-term future. Those are, that's money that we would be giving to an out-of-state corporation who would pack its bags and leave as soon as they've exploited our resources. We don't want that sort of uh, drain on our local economy. Right now- Would they not hire locally then? They, they're not hiring locally, no. And you can see that in any state that has chosen to take up fracking. Uh, I was born and raised in Colorado, and I've seen what fracking has done to the economy in Colorado since uh, since the you know big gas industries have moved in. They have not hired local. They have not employed people who are going to be there for the long haul. Instead, they tend to import folks from out of state, and those those resources that they extract then move back out of state. It's it's a you know an internal offshore if you will. It's it's sending the money outside of the state borders, and, and we can't afford that. Right. And um, I, I also want to talk about uh, Seneca Lake, you know, near and dear to our area. I'm sure uh, you know about the LPG storage that's going on right. there. It kind of goes hand in hand with the fracking situation. Um, Crestwood Midstream, they want to expand the storage uh, on the lake or on the shores of the lake. Uh, how do you feel about that, uh, that proposal. Similarly, I'm opposed to that. I don't think that we can invest in gas infrastructure and in gas storage that is not going to be there for the long haul. Uh, we need to invest our new money into new resources and make sure that we're not continuing to prop up an industry that's vanishing. Uh, we need to move away from a fossil fuel economy. Obviously, we are still dependent on fossil fuels to a certain extent, but we need to make sure that our new investment is going in the direction of of the economy as it's going to be for the 21st century. Uh, I don't want to see us continue to throw good money after bad, mm. and I want to see those new jobs here. An example is Renovus uh, in Ulysses. Four years ago, I think Renovus had eight employees, and just this year it announced that it had 80 employees, and that's in solar, and I want to see those sorts of jobs coming to the southern tier in the Finger Lakes. There's more jobs in solar right now than there are in gas extraction across the country. Wow. We need those jobs here. So you mentioned Renovus and 80 employees is, you know, nothing to uh, scoff at. I mean, that is significant, but how come I feel like the, the, the development of solar um, energy and, and that business isn't growing at the rate that some of the Democrats say. I mean, it, it's still expensive to, to install uh, solar on roofs, or is that a, a misnomer? I think you might feel that way because that's what the fossil fuel industry wants you to believe. Mm. But actually, when you look at the numbers, it's not accurate. Uh, as I said, there are more jobs in solar right now than there are in natural gas extraction across the country. That's true on the facts. Uh, and also, you know, we're, we're seeing a movement toward other sorts of renewable energy. We're seeing wind power. We're seeing hydroelectric. We're seeing uh, biofuels. And we need to start investing in all of that here in the southern tier. And, and frankly, the corruption in Albany is pulling pulling that job investment away from here. So we're not seeing as much of that as we'd like to see in the Southern tier and, and other parts of New York State are getting some of that money and I wanna see it come here. I want you to hold that thought because we are gonna talk about the corruption that's happening in Albany. We do have to take a quick break though, uh, but stay with us, we'll be right back with more Leslie Danks Burke talking about corruption in Albany, stay with us. And we're back now uh, with Leslie Danks Burke running for state senator. And uh, we were just finishing talking about corruption. Uh, I want to put you back on the record here and talk about the corruption that's happened in Albany. You know, obviously mentioning uh, Dean Scalos, Sheldon Silver, recently convicted of corruption. And what, in your opinion, do you think is enabling the corruption in our state capital? So the real problem that we have in Albany is not the things that people are going to jail for. And you're right, we've seen. Democratic leader of the assembly, mm -hmm. uh, Sheldon Silver, go indicted and convicted and he's going to jail. And then same thing on the Republican Senate side. We've seen uh, Dean Scalos indicted and convicted and he's going to jail. And that's a huge challenge, but we're addressing that challenge, right? We yeah. see these indictments happening. The bigger problem that we've got are the things that are allowed 
in Albany. And we have to change the rules so that conflicts of interest that currently are allowed in New York State are no longer the law. I am choosing in my own campaign not to accept campaign contributions through the so-called LLC loophole, which is a way that big corporations can funnel money into candidates' coffers. I also refuse to accept money through the so-called party committee loophole, which is another way that uh, political committees have been able to funnel money into candidates' campaigns outside of the normal channels. And even though I am more transparent about my campaign donations and more disclosive and I refuse to accept these unethical sources of funds, we are a very strong fundraising race. So it's clear that people are willing to support candidates who stand up for fair dealing and open disclosure. I also am refusing to accept outside income. Now what is outside income? Outside income is when a elected official who is paid by the state of New York for his elected work is also receiving a second paycheck from a private entity. And that happens in New York State because our elected officials are part-time uh, electeds, right? right. And there's this dream out there that maybe their other job, their real job, is you know working at a store on Main Street or serving as a teacher or you know being one of the people. But that's not what actually happens. What actually happens is that our elected officials are also lobbyists. They are paid by lobbying firms that are registered lobbyists in Albany. And my opponent right now is an elected official who also is paid a second paycheck by a registered lobbying firm in Albany. And that is something I refuse to participate in. I am foregoing outside income while I'm running for office, and I will continue to reject that after I'm elected. So you mentioned your opponent, and, and you know, Mr. O'Mara does practice uh, law while he is a is our current state senator. Um, you also practice law yourself. Are you willing to stop practicing if you're elected? I actually have already stopped because I want to run my campaign exactly the way I will continue to be once I'm in office. I'm a very what you see is what you get person. The, the voters out there can see that I am walking the talk already. I have chosen to forego outside income during my campaign and I'll continue to do that once I'm elected. You mentioned uh, that there's a lot of laws in place that allows for unlimited campaign contributions. Um, what kinds of specific proposals can you bring to Albany to cut out all the big money that's going into our state government uh, officials? We've got to cut out the LLC loophole. We have got to stop corporations from being able to fund mon funnel money into campaigns through multiple ports. Mm. And that's what the LLC loophole is, is one corporation can send money into a campaign through multiple different uh, sources. And, and that ends up being an undue influence by that corporation. Do you think we need to take it even a step further and, and not allow politicians in Albany to hold a second job and, and make being a state senator or, or a representative a full-time job? I am opposed to outside income. I am opposed to senators holding an additional job while they're supposed to be doing the people's work because that additional job that they're holding tends to be as lobbyists. And that's a real problem when the same person who's making the laws is also working for a law firm that's the lobbyist. I do want to talk about farming because I know you have a background of, uh, you know, your parents were farmers, correct, growing up? Or one so of your parents? My parents are farmers now. When I was growing up, we had the farm, but we didn't live on the farm. I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and my parents moved to a small town in Eastern Colorado called Kersey after I graduated from high school. And they've been farming for the last 22 years. They farm feed corn and feed wheat. And the kind of farming that is starting to take over Colorado and that has taken over a significant portion of our country is the kind of farming that we don't want in New York State. And it's really pushing small farms under. Uh, every year, my dad has to sign a contract with a uh, corporate buyer who purchases his his feed at the end of the year mm -hmm. and that contract outlines every single facet of production and if he doesn't follow every single little piece in that contract then he doesn't have someone to sell to at the end of the year because there's no one else buying other than this one big ag conglomerate. We don't want to see that happen in New York State. We've got small farms that are the backbone of our local economy. I talked a little bit about how the southern tier is continuing to lose jobs even though the rest of the state of New York is, is just starting to come back out of the recession. Yeah. The one area that we are gaining jobs 
in New York State and in the Southern Tier is in agriculture mm. and in agritourism. So that's an industry we want to start investing in. And tourists are coming here because they love the natural resources that we have to offer. They love our small farms. They like to join the cheese trail and the wine trail. We've got to invest in our small farms, make sure that they can scale up to profitability, that they're not burdened by high taxes, and that we have this land for generations to come. So you mentioned uh, big agriculture is you know a reason why you think some of our local farmers are struggling, and they are struggling. I mean, just talking with them, uh, you know, doing stories about local farming, especially our dairy farmers. Um, how yeah, especially can... in Steuben County. Steuben County is losing uh, small dairy farmers right, right and left, and that's that's a real challenge. We got to stop that. And they've told me that uh, you know they are having to compete with some of the bigger dairy companies um, it, who are set up both locally and nationally, and that's really driving the price down. So, how do you make it more of a fair uh, market for our local dairy farmers uh, if you were to be elected? So we have to get the government's thumb off the scale in the favor of big corporate ag. Uh, dairy prices, you brought up dairy farming, and this is, this is more of a federal issue. Uh, dairy prices have been rigged uh, by a collusion between big dairy and the federal government mm -hmm. for years. And the price of milk has bottomed out to, I think, 1963 levels again yeah. here just in the last couple of years. And, and folks are closing up shop and they're saying, we, we can't make a living at dairy anymore. That's a real problem when we're starting to lose our local backbone of our economy. And we need to invest in making sure that there are options available to our local farmers. I, I'm deeply disappointed that the Kraft plant is closing here. Uh, Kraft you know, threatened to close a few plants across the state and ours is the one that is, that is getting shut down. I think we need some elected officials who are gonna get in there and develop those relationships and, and fight hard for our region so that sort of thing doesn't happen to us. I wanna switch gears here and talk about the SAFE Act for a second because I know I read on your website that you have called the SAFE Act a failed, or, or a, excuse me, a flawed piece of legislation. And you know, obviously there's a lot of gun owners in this area and uh, they're very anti-SAFE Act. So specifically about the SAFE Act, what do you think is flawed about it? What would you change about the SAFE Act? The SAFE Act came through Albany the same way so much legislation comes through Albany, and that's in a backroom deal in this three men in a room style of government that we have calling the shots now. And the result was a piece of legislation that unduly burdens our law-abiding gun owners and doesn't solve the problem of guns in the hands of people who would do us harm. And let's just remember the context that the SAFE Act came through in. In 2012, we experienced as a nation the, the tragedy of the Sandy Hook massacre. And that really tore a hole in our national consciousness. And there were people uh, of all persuasions crying out for something to be done about gun violence. And at that time, it was clear that we had a lot in common, people who uh, believe in, in the right to bear arms and believe in the Second Amendment, as I do, mm -hmm. uh, along with other folks who were more concerned about getting guns out of the hands of people who do us harm. We, we had agreement on where the rules should go. But that's not what happened. Instead, just a month later, uh, Albany pushed through in the dead of night a piece of legislation that, that doesn't close loopholes, that doesn't keep guns out of the hands of criminals, but instead creates excessive barriers to lawful gun ownership. So I think that, uh, you know, folks on the right would say uh, some of the people that pushed that law through were kind of taking advantage of the situation at Sandy Hook to try and pass um, legislation restricting uh, military style weapons. So, um, again, I want to ask what specifically would you change about it uh, to make it less restrictive on gun owners? So you're exactly right that what happened was the gun owners weren't at the table. And the gun owners were not included in the conversation, and so you ended up with a piece of legislation that didn't make any sense. You have magazine limits in there that, that actually don't correlate with any actual gun. Right. Uh, and so we need gun owners at the table to give us that information, to tell us what is accurate and what's not. Just like you don't pass women's health care legislation without women in the conversation, mm -hmm. you don't pass gun legislation without gun owners in the conversation. And so what I would do differently, and I would not have voted for the SAFE Act if I were in office at the time that it was passed. Uh, it's on the books now, it's what we've got, and what we need to do is engage 
gun owners in the conversation so that we can go back and fix these glaring problems that exist in the legislation and, and make it do what it was designed to do. Are you in favor of, uh, of widespread background checks? Um, and, and really the, the SAFE Act was an attack on assault style weapons, like I said. So are you in favor of a ban on assault style weapons? So most gun owners agree with background checks. And I stand with law-abiding gun owners who, who believe in background checks. Uh, in terms of assault weapons, the term assault weapons actually doesn't really mean much. It's, mm. it's not a word that gun owners use to describe any particular style of weapon. And it's not defined well in that piece of legislation. So what we need to do is go back and figure out what we're actually talking about, which kinds of guns we're actually talking about, right. and make sure that, that we're all on the same page about that. Okay, I want to move on to education. Um, this is a question we've got, uh, a, we've heard a lot about on social media, and, and that is Common Core and the Common Core standard. Um, how do you feel about Common Core, and would you make any changes to it? <laughs> I'd make a lot of changes to it. And I've been endorsed by NYSIT, which is the United Teachers of New York State, and I'm very proud to have their support of my campaign. And I'm a product of public schools. My mother was a public school teacher. My kids are going to public school. And I've seen that the botched Common Core rollout has really pulled teachers away from the classroom. Mm. And it means the teachers aren't able to make decisions about what's happening in their own classrooms. It means they're having to teach to the test. It also means that teachers are being pulled away from the schools with greatest need, right? If, if a teacher is being evaluated based on how well that teacher's students perform, right. then you know, teachers might be interested in going to higher performing schools and that's gonna really shortchange our schools even further. So I want to see Common Core really looked at so that we don't have this teach to the test model and so that big corporations, the testing corporations that are making money off of the success of testing of our kids are not who's calling the shots in the classrooms. I wanna see the teachers call the shots. We've gotta uh, roll back the quantity of testing that we're having and the testing can't be correlated with uh, teacher evaluations and, and teacher salaries. Okay, uh, really quickly, um, we're running out of time, but I wanna ask you, uh, Ithaca is on the verge of potentially bringing in refugees um, from Syria, uh, and if they are approved, I mean, these refugees are coming. Does any of, the, any of that concern you about you know, the safety of this region, potential for uh, you know, radical terrorists to, to be brought into the United States via that method? No, I have a lot of confidence in our immigration forces, and I think that anyone who is evaluating folks who's, who, who are coming into this country is looking very carefully at whether they are a potential threat. And there is no way that simply uh, profiling someone based on their race or or you know, where they come from is going to do the job. There's much more sophisticated techniques than we have, and we should be using those. All right, Leslie, uh, just one quick Thing, I want to give you a chance to plug your website where people can find all the information about the issues and where you stand on them. What's the website? My website is leslieforsenate.com, all spelled out, L-E-S-L-I-E-F-O-R-S-E-N-A-T-E.com. And I'd love it for you to go and take a look and there's a way to contact me through that website. I've been really open about the fact that I'm, I'm available at the other end of a phone call or at the other end of an email if anyone wants to write me or let me know what they think. And that's how I become a better candidate and it's how I'll be a better senator once I'm elected. All right, Leslie Danksberg, thanks so much for coming on the record with us and uh, discussing the issues facing the folks here in the Southern Tier and uh, best of luck in the November election. Thanks very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, stay tuned, coming up we do have uh, current Senator Tom O'Mara. We're gonna put him on the record and find out where he stands on the same issues. That's coming up. Welcome back and thanks for watching On The Record where we ask the local candidates where they stand on the issues affecting you. And right now I'm joined by our current Senator, Tom O'Mara. I'm sure you recognize him. Tom, thanks so much for being here. Thanks Ross for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Of course. And uh, now most people I'm sure at home know who you are, but uh, for the few who don't, um, you're from Horseheads. Tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, I was uh, born in Elmira at St. Joseph's Hospital. I uh, was raised in Horseheads. Uh, went to Horseheads High School, graduated in 1981. Uh, went away to college uh, and law school. Uh, worked for a few years uh, in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office after law school from 91 to 94 and then returned here in 94. Went into uh, law practice uh, uh, with my father in a small firm uh, in Elmira back in 1994. Worked part-time in the DA's office, uh, was the District Attorney of Chemung County 
uh, for a period, and then I was uh, Chemung County attorney uh, for a while as well, while continuing in private practice in Elmira. So that's basically been my career before I went to the uh, state assembly, uh, where I where I served three terms, right. uh, and then uh, now I'm serving my third term in the state senate and looking to be reelected. So you've been in state politics for over a decade now, and you've been in the southern tier pretty much your whole life. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, people recognize you, and I do want to get into the issues right away. Sure. Um, I you know peruse through your website a lot, and really the first thing you touched on was jobs in, in this area and how that is your number one priority. Yeah. Um, but no as doubt. you know, uh, you know jobs, especially in Elmira, but also Shimon County. Um, have actually been on the decline the past year. I mean, the last jobs report, we lost 800 non-farm jobs in Elmira alone, uh, whereas most of the state is thriving. What do you attribute that to? Well, you know, uh, as, uh, as you said, I've lived here my whole life. Uh, and unfortunately, over the years, in the economic cycles that we have, uh, the southern tier has always lagged behind going into a recession and unfortunately even more lag behind coming out of a recession. Mm. Uh, the downturn uh, in a lot of the jobs recently, I believe, has to do with the downturn in the natural gas industry in the northern tier of Pennsylvania, uh, and also still still hurting and reeling a little bit from the loss of Sikorsky uh, a couple years ago. Uh, but we're making progress. You know, we just had a great announcement with the relocation of Booker M. Hart Glass this past week. Right. Uh, good job retention and some jobs to be added there. We still have a strong manufacturing base uh, in the southern tier. A higher percentage of our jobs are in manufacturing here than o any other region of the state. Uh, and while manufacturing certainly isn't what it was once here, it isn't anywhere in the United States. And, and we're looking very, very aggressively to how we can foster manufacturing and help build those job numbers back up. I believe there's a lot of optimism mm. uh, in the area right now. Certainly with the regional council funds that have come in or will be coming in uh, are gonna help. The, the Emhart uh, Booker Glass uh, plant was an example of a very successful regional council project. And, um, you know, $500 million coming here to the Southern Tier, part of that upstate yeah. revitalization initiative that I know you were a big part of. Um, how does the, uh, you know, how does the area spend on planning, uh, pl excuse me, plan on spending that money yeah. um, and putting it back in to bring more jobs to yeah. the area? Well, that, that's the key. Um, you know, we finally, at this point, we have the Southern Tier uh, on the radar uh, of the executive uh, in Albany. Uh, he's, the governor has made it clear that he understands that the southern tier needs attention and needs help. And we've shown that uh, with the leadership of the regional council for the southern tier, particularly with the leadership of co-chairman uh, Tom Tranner uh, from Corning, that the southern tier region has won four, has been a top winner in four out of the first five rounds of the regional councils. Mm. One of the top three uh, upstate revitalization initiative awards. We just got $40 million for our airport here to upgrade for a $60 million project. $10 million for downtown revitalization. But the question you ask is the critical question. How are we going to spend it? And we have a, a great group of people on this regional council. They're going to be rev reviewing proposals and the applications uh, that come in. This is once in a generation or greater opportunity with economic incentives to come into our region. We need to make sure we spend it wisely. I believe the projects that we have uh, done already in the early rounds of the regional councils have been successful and we're going to continue to build on that success. You mentioned some of the uh, you know the, the jobs that we've lost you know manufacturing and, and plants especially the the craft plant was a big loss. Um, is that something that you have worked out on addressing in Albany? Absolutely. It's my number one focus is manufacturing and the craft plant is not lost. Uh, the craft plant uh, behind the scenes I believe things are, are going very positively. Okay. Uh, there's, there's significant and serious discussions going on between uh, one major um, uh, company to, to come in and take that over. Kraft, uh, my understanding, is committed to taking 40 to 50 percent of the production of cheese from that plant. Uh, I'm very optimistic that we're going to have uh, a good result there. Um, I've worked uh, very closely with Jamie Johnson, who's the Stabenn County uh, IDA director there, very involved in economic development. He used to work here in Chemung County. Uh, he does a great job. He keeps me informed as much as he can throughout this process, and I've worked with uh, the governor's office and Empire State Development that I think we're going to have a good outcome there. But two years ago, with the focus on manufacturing, we were able to, the budget last year, um, remove the uh, income taxes for manufacturing entities, the state income taxes for manufacturing entities in New York. We need to make New York's business climate more friendly, more competitive, and being ranked 49th or 50th as we are every year is not doing it. You know, nobody said it better than Governor Cuomo in his early years, that New York State has no future as the tax capital of the nation. I've taken that to heart. I fortunately haven't heard the governor say that as frequently as he used to, mm. uh, but we have made progress in the manufacturing tax last year. This year, we came, came out in the budget with a 20% state income tax reduction for the middle class. 
uh, which is virtually everybody uh, in this area, and that's going to help small business owners uh, as well. I think we're taking major steps uh, in the right direction. You know, your opponent has accused, um, you know, our area of not getting our fair share, as uh, as Ms. Danksburg has, has said, um, you know, of taxpayer money, that it's being funneled downstate. Uh, what's your response to that? It, it, I know you have denied those yeah. claims, so who's well, telling the truth? Well, I can tell you I'm telling the truth, and I've delivered for this district uh, that she talks about transportation funding and parity. Mm. You know, we lost transportation parity between uh, the downstate MTA region and the rest of the state. We lost that in 2009, 2010, a two-year period when the Democrats controlled the state Senate, the only two-year period uh, in my lifetime that that has happened. And in that two-year period, parity was taken away between spending on transportation projects downstate and upstate. Myself and Phil, Phil Palmasano working on that uh, steadfastly for the past five years. We've been the leader in that regard. Mm. We, no, we now have parity returned to upstate and non-New York City funding compared to, to New York City funding. We have gotten the largest share of transportation dollars in the Southern Tier region than any other region in the state. We've delivered, I've delivered, uh, my opponent is just completely wrong in misrepresenting those facts in that regard. You've been uh, ex extremely critical of the unfunded mandates, like you mentioned. Can yeah. you kind of explain, uh, you know, what you're talking about and, and why it's so bad for our area? Well, it's bad. It, it, Medicaid spending is the biggest one. Medicaid is a federal program. Uh, the, the states uh, pay half the cost, and the federal government pays half the cost. The states uh, in, in New York, uh, one of the uh, maybe the last one, or maybe one or other two states, they have a local share, and they charge the counties a portion. It started out at, in New York at 25 percent the counties were paying of the Medicaid bill. Our Medicaid bill statewide is now about $60 billion. Yeah. The local share of Medicaid is now down to about $8, $8 billion. We've, we've uh, capped the growth for counties, so that's no longer growing. Mm. Uh, it was growing at 3 to 5% a year. Uh, we capped it for a few years, uh, kept the growth of it, now we kept it firm. I have legislation that I've introduced uh, and have been pushing for for five years uh, to have a phase out of that local share of uh, $8 billion. Uh, that is some large amount that we can't do, I believe, uh, responsibly in one year, but we can phase it out over a period of years. My legislation calls for f phasing out that $8 billion local share over seven years. I think that's something we can feasibly do with the state within the confines of our budget. We have kept uh, state spending to under 2% per year for the last six years. Uh, we've had the property tax cap in place for six years, and that has helped uh, rein in the steady growth in property taxes. You're not in favor of ripping, up, you know, Medicaid away um, no. because, you, you know, you've said that it helps out, uh, you know, tons of New Yorkers, but it does need changes. So specifically, what kind of changes are you talking about? Well, I, I believe we need uh, better oversight and, and streamlining of operations, uh, cut some of the overhead, but, but more importantly, cut some of the fraud, waste and abuse. Uh, I've been a, that, that was the major factor of my getting involved in the state legislature. I never had a, a goal of becoming a state legislator. I was working as county attorney dealing with the struggle of unfunded mandates with Medicaid being the biggest one. I was county attorney in Chemung County working for Tom Santulli. Mm. That's why I went to work with the idea of relieving these unfunded mandates. We need Medicaid. It provides great benefits for people in this community and across the state that need it. But there is a great deal of fraud, waste, and abuse. If, if it's approaching a $60 billion program statewide right now and it's growing exponentially every year, we need to really make sure we're, we're spending the dollars on those that need it, those that deserve it, and make sure that it's not being uh, um, uh, taken advantage of by those that, that uh, aren't entitled to it or those that are misusing the system. Sure. I think everyone could agree on that. Yeah. Um, and, we, and we think that waste uh, is conservatively in the range of 10 to 15 percent of a $60 billion figure. That's a lot of savings. Yeah, for, for sure. And uh, I do want to switch gears a little bit, though, and, mm -hmm. and uh, talk about corruption here for a second, because it is an issue that, you know, taxpayers have brought up to us, corruption in Albany. I want to read a quote from your website, because the first thing, you know, in addressing corruption that is written there, it says, it's been said that you can pass as many laws as you want, but if criminals are intent on committing crimes, laws won't stop them. That's as true of violent street crime as it is of public corruption. As a former prosecutor, I know that for a fact. That's what you wrote yeah. on your website. Do you think that that is the right mentality to take in addressing public corruption, that you know, cor corrupt officials are going to continue to, to be corrupt and, and laws won't correct that? Isn't that the job of the, of the state senator and the state legislators to enact laws that are going to be tougher on corruption to uh, prevent it? Yes, and, and, and we do, and we have. We have uh, um, increased the amount of uh, 
uh, financial disclosure from each member of the legislature. We've done it twice in the past five years, uh, requiring greater and greater disclosure of what outside income is made, where you're making uh, money elsewhere than the legislature in profession. And I believe it's important to have a citizen legislature with people that work in the real world and go to the state capitol, pass laws, pass a state budget. Everyone that has been convicted of corruption has been convicted under the current bribery and corruption laws we have. One of the biggest concerns of the public and myself was that many of those that were convicted were still able to draw on their pension. We have now passed the first phase of a constitutional amendment to, to allow the judge in a corruption case to forfeit that pension of the convicted corrupt official so that they don't continue to benefit uh, uh, from their government service by receiving a pension. Uh, that's a huge step in the right direction uh, mm. to get that done. And I would note that we passed that in the Senate last year with a three-way agreement with the governor and the assembly, and uh, the assembly backed away from that agreement last year, and we had to come back and renegotiate it again this year. It has to be passed again in next year's legislature, and then it will go for a public referendum, which I would assume would be a 99.9% .9 uh, yes vote across the country, or yeah. across the state on that. Uh, because individuals shouldn't continue uh, to receive their pension after that. But, you know, the laws we have in place, and, and it's just part of the, the human condition. Um, humans are involved. Uh, humans are susceptible uh, to fraud and corruption uh, and bribery. Uh, the public needs to pay better attention with the individuals are electing to these offices. But we've seen a great deal more investigation and enforcement of these laws that we have. And that's what's led to uh, the increased notoriety of these cases rooting out the corruption and making sure we have aggressive prosecution on these because nobody should be taking advantage of their uh, official position uh, through those types of means. All right, Senator, I, I don't want to cut you off. We do have to take a quick yeah. break, but I want to continue talking about this topic after the break. Stay with us. You're watching On the Record. We'll be right back. Welcome back to On the Record, Election 2016. I'm sitting down with current Senator Tom O'Mara. Uh, Tom is up for re-election in November's election. Um, and we're talking about your campaign and how the process is a little long, but it's going well, right? Yeah, I think the campaign's going really well. I've been working extremely hard uh, on the campaign trail, you know, covering the five counties uh, that are included in the Senate District, from, from uh, Ithaca to Hornell, mm. uh, Penyan, Dundee, uh, Middlesex, Yates County, uh, uh, rural, suburban, uh, small city atmosphere, and, yeah. I, and I believe uh, uh, we've been working really hard, running a good, solid, positive campaign uh, on the issues, doing a lot, as much door-to-door -door as I can in between other uh, events and meetings, uh, getting a very positive response. We were talking about corruption in Albany and, and how to root that out uh, you know, of our state capital and, and our state legislators. Um, you mentioned that you had pushed uh, for a bill to eliminate pensions for a anyone convicted of corruption in Albany, but I think some people would say, why not take it a step further? I mean, this should be a nonpartisan issue. Uh, are, are you opposed to taking it a step further and, and you know, putting limits on, on um, campaign funding and, and that kind of stuff? Well, there's a lot of things out, out there for campaign funding. I, I think we could be well served with reducing the contribution limits that uh, individuals uh, and, and uh, entities can, uh, can provide to uh, campaigns right now. Uh, the limit is uh, $11,000 in a Senate race. Um, you know, it's, it's unusual that I get a contribution, uh, uh, you know, over, over 1000 is is big. Every once in a while you get a $5,000 one. But, you know, we spend a lot of time fundraising uh, for that, and limits in that regard I think would be reasonable. But one of the big proposals out there is for public uh, campaign financing, which, yeah. is, which is taxpayer financed, whatever whatever uh, contributions a, a candidate got up to $250 from an individual will be matched six times by taxpayer dollars. Right. That has been estimated to, to cost statewide um, 200 to $300 million to enforce a program like that, uh, to fund a program like that. And then your taxpayer dollars are going to fund everybody's campaigns. People that you may be vehemently opposed to, you're giving tax dollars for them to run their campaigns. I don't think that's appropriate at all. I think it's a misuse of taxpayer dollars. My opponent supports taxpayer-funded um, campaigns. Well, let's talk about uh, kind of her stance on things because I think another one of the proposals that she's in favor of that has been thrown around is, um, you know, capping the amount of income that you can get from a second job. I know you uh, continue to practice as a lawyer during mm -hmm. your time as a state senator. Um, Ms. Danks Burke has already said she has stopped practicing as a lawyer. Why? Um, 
why do you continue to practice it? And are, why are you opposed to um, capping the amount that, that uh, legislators can take from a second job? Well, I don't understand the whole concept of capping outside income. You, you, so you can be a little successful, but you can't be really successful. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me uh, in our American uh, society. Well, the, I think in some cases, not to cut you off, but I, I know um, some campaigns do take, uh, or excuse me, some lawyers and law firms take funding from clients who are, are lobbyists, and, and you've been accused of that, I know. Yeah, uh, and, do you want to respond? Yeah, and I can respond to that, that, that I do no legal activities, receive no compensation or revenues from the firm, in any way affiliated to any matters dealing with the state. Uh, it's a large law firm now that our firm is merged into. There are other members of the legislature in the firm. There are other members of the firm that are in uh, smaller government uh, um, offices. Uh, we take it very seriously. There are what's called ethical walls that are set up between any matter uh, dealing with the, uh, the entity that, that I represent, and in my case, the state. If somebody worked for the county, it would be a county, that uh, there's to be no contact between an attorney and the firm working on that file. And, and, and the uh, elected member or no sharing of revenues. You know, it's very easy to say that, that for my opponent to say she's taking a leave from her law firm uh, and she's filed a financial disclosure like I file. She's filed that she was of counsel at this firm in Ithaca. However, she's, she's reported no, uh, no income from that position for 2015. Mm. So this is, this is a big sacrifice she's making, taking a leave from a job she gets no income from. You know, I, I need the outside income to support my family. And I work very hard at my Senate job, and I work as hard as I can uh, at my law job. I can tell you I, I put one heck of a more amount of time into uh, my job uh, in the Senate, representing the 58th Senate District, uh, than I do uh, the time I spend in my law practice. So you mentioned that, you know, you use that second income to... to to finance your family, and no one can fault you for that, but then why not eliminate the possibility of a conflict of interest by uh, eliminating second jobs and making um, being a state senator a full-time job and, and increasing the rate and giving them a raise and people like yourself who do work so hard for the state as, as a public servant, why not make it a full-time job? Uh, because I firmly believe in a citizen legislature. I think members of the legislature, as our founding fathers thought, should be involved in the real world, working in their communities, uh, that they're representing and knowing what the and having to deal with the impacts of the laws uh, that are passed uh, in that regard. I don't think we should be full time. Look, there's a debate going on right now about whether there should be a pay raise for the legislature mm. that the legislature hasn't had a pay raise in 19 years. Yeah. And by and large, the public opinion is no way, no how. If we're going to go to a full time legislature, we're not going to be talking about a raise for legislators. We're going to be talking about a huge increase in the salaries. I don't believe the public want. I don't believe they want full-time legislatures spending more time in the Capitol. As it is with the part-time legislature we have, there's, there's approximately 11 or 12,000 bills that are introduced each year. There, there is a lot, a lot of wasted time in Albany. We could get by with doing the budget, which is the biggest work we do in Albany each year, and having a much shortened legislative cycle to deal with legislative items. Uh, we don't need to be introducing 12,000 bills a year in the legislature in both houses. Uh, is a huge waste. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, another role that you play a as a state senator. You're the acting chairman of the Senate's uh, Environmental Conservation Committee. Yeah. Um, it's a big position, of course, and, and you've done some great work. I know, uh, you know, fighting invasive species. What other things have you worked on in that role? Yeah. Uh, before I answer that, because I didn't explicitly say the last question, I do not support a pay raise for the New York State Legislature. Right. And as I said, I don't support a full-time legislature either. Um, on the environment, I'm proud of the work I've done as chairman of the Environmental Conservation Committee. I've been in that position since February of last year. Yeah. Uh, right off the bat, I was thrown into it in the middle of the budget process. Uh, the Brownfield cleanup program for, for environmentally contaminated sites was coming to an end. We were able to negotiate and get a 10-year extension uh, of that legislation to help clean up and reuse uh, dirty sites. W this year, we were able to uh, uh, get a record amount of funding for the Environmental Protection Fund to $300 million a year to help for things like invasive species, uh, as you mentioned. I've helped with funding to, to fight the hydrilla problem in the Cayuga Inlet uh, in Ithaca, uh, waters going into Cayuga Lake with the hydrilla, mm. um, a huge problem, very aggressive uh, invasive species. Uh, I've uh, sponsored with my uh, uh, counterpart in the assembly from across the aisle, Barbara Lifton in Ithaca, uh, of a clean drain and dry, requiring people that are trailing their boats in and out of a body of water 
to check and remove plant life, vegetation, any any type of uh, living organism that's on there right. so they don't transfer it from one body of water to another, helping the spread of that. And one of the uh, other most important things I've done over the last two years as chairman is developed a grant fund of several hundred million dollars a year to help municipalities uh, in renovate, improve, extend, or build new water or sewer systems, infrastructure that's aging and ailing in our communities to help make sure that we're getting good clean water uh, to those that need the water and making sure we're treating uh, this, the, the waste before it's going back into the environment. Uh, one, one big area I've worked on there has been in Watkins Glen uh, with Project Seneca and helping get significant funding for the uh, replacement of their water treatment facility, which is, which is right on the edge of Seneca Lake. Mm -hmm. It's been underperforming for years with excess effluent going into the lake, not good for the clean water. Uh, that project is moving ahead uh, great, and that's been millions of dollars of support. Now, I know uh, you have rightfully been championed for some of the, you know, those things that you mentioned, uh, the work you've done, but you also have drawn some criticism from some of the uh, environmentalists, um, especially for the policy on allowing fracking dumping, um, you know, the, the waste from fracking to be dumped here at landfills in Chemung, Steuben County, uh, and you were one of the swing votes that allowed that to happen. Why uh, did you vote in favor of that? Well, we, we still have conventional drilling uh, for natural gas in New York State. Uh, and those, the waste is called drill cuttings that come out. Uh, a lot of people confuse this with, with the flow back water from fracking, which is the dirty water that comes back out. That is not coming here and being dumped in our landfills. This is the dirt and rock that's crushed up and drilled out uh, as the sawdust, so to speak, that comes out. Uh, and it comes and it's delivered and put into our landfills. Uh, there's been concerns of that for radioactivity. Right. Uh, radioactivity monitors have been put into every landfill uh, that has accepted this waste, and not once has there been, uh, in, in our Chemung County landfill, not once has there been an elevated reading for radioactivity with this waste coming in. It is not necessarily hazardous waste, as the opponents want to just automatically make it out to be. It's not, automatic, it's not automatically criteria qualified or have the criteria for hazardous waste and it should be treated as what it is when it's being delivered and just have a blanket uh, opposition to it. It's just one more way that, that, that the groups that are opposed to gas are trying to shut down that in every possible way they can. I've been a supporter of natural gas exploration in this area. I think we, we could be able to do it uh, responsibly and reasonably uh, here in New York State with strong oversight. Uh, from DEC. Mm. Uh, we've done it in our conventional drilling over the years. We, we, at the beginning of the fracking boom, so to speak, we, at the start of that, New York State had far better, in a way, regulations and procedures in place uh, than Pennsylvania had. And that's why you saw some of the problems in Pennsylvania. But I think that uh, we, could, we could properly do it here in New York. Now, the, obviously, the that energy market is turned down uh, at this point because of the market. Uh, it'll be back someday. Uh, this gas isn't going away. Uh, it's, a, it's a great natural resource. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to be utilizing uh, fossil fuels for a long time in our country. As, as, as great as our efforts are, and I support pursuing renewable energy of, of solar, wind, the great hydropower we have in New York State, uh, and we're going to get to 50% uh, renewable generation for electricity. Mm -hmm. But our home heating fuels and our business fuels for industry are 90% fossil fuel based. So we're nowhere near, in that regard, right. getting close to our heating needs uh, at times of the year when solar is much lower producing uh, than when we need the heat than, than it is during the summer months. Okay, uh, I want to sneak one more question in. We're really low on time, but um, I've given every other uh, candidate a chance to explain um, their stance on the opioid and heroin epidemic. It's killing people in our area all over the country. Uh, what's your plan to, to fight it? Well, very quickly, I've been on the Senate Heroin and Opioid Task Force for three years. We've had that forum meet across the state, met here in Elmira, we've met in Penyan. This year we put a package together out of that task force of about $190 million going towards uh, addiction services to help with detoxification centers, inpatient treatment centers, uh, and working with uh, people in the community to provide resources for those that are addicted. We gotta start treating it as the public health crisis that it is. It's a public health crisis of addiction. Mm. Uh, law enforcement and prosecution have come around uh, to working in that regard. We make it, we're making a lot of progress, but it is, it is an epidemic that we're dealing with, and we can't legislate our way out of it. We do need to, to create and provide funding for better treatment options, which we've been woefully lacking, particularly in rural areas, but even in urban areas, and we're making progress in that. 
Uh, where are we lacking more in, in terms of strict laws for dealers and, and people you know, using these drugs or uh, in treatment facilities for people who are addicted? We're, we're certainly more lacking in the treatment facilities in dealing with the addictions. Um, part of the package that we produced uh, this year limited an initial prescription of opioid medication by a physician to a seven-day allotment rather than a lot of them were prescribing 30-day right. allotments. We also removed the, the insurance company pre-authorization uh, for the insurance company to allow somebody to get into an inpatient treatment center when they're able to be treated and uh, also uh, eliminated the pre-authorization for uh, substance abuse uh, supporting drugs such as Vivitrol and Suboxone that an individual can take and it removes their craving uh, to pursue that addiction. These are some of the steps we've taken that are, that are in the right direction. Uh, we've seen already 35 new inpatient beds coming to a facility in, in uh, Tompkins County. Uh, Ithaca is moving forward with a, with a new dox detoxification facility. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be doing those more in other areas so there's greater access for the individuals that need it. Now, I know there's a lot of issues that I didn't get to. Um, I, if you want, I want to give you a chance to plug your website where people can get more information yeah. on the things that you didn't get to touch on. Yeah. Well, uh, my website is uh, www.omaraforsenate.com. Uh, I have a Facebook page that is very active. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, very easy to find those. You can you can read up a lot on there. But the Facebook has a lot, and I uh, uh, just urge everybody to please uh, get out and vote uh, this year. Every vote counts, uh, and I'd be honored uh, to receive your vote. All right, Senator. Thanks for going on the record with us. Thank Appreciate you. it. And that does it for On the Record. Make sure to join us next week when I sit down with the local candidates running for a seat in the United States Congress, Tom Reed and John Plum. Thanks again for watching. Good night. On the Record, Election 2016, presented by WENY News.